Okay, so thank you very much for having me here. Today I'm presenting um, a work which is not really, um, I mean, the last thing I'm working on, but this is something I'm interested in, and it's about uh, forecasting asylum related migration flows using machine learning and dates at different resolution and different scales. This is a joint work with Marcello Caramia, which is also in the room, and Teddy Wilkin from formerly EASO agency, now EUA agency. Uh, although the, I think the most important part of this work is not about really forecasting, it's about how this, this process that I'm going to present, this model, um, may provide useful information about uh, these flows. Okay, this was the, the system that we set up at EASO. So I keep saying yeah, so because this is when we did this. And it's about taking data from uh, different inputs. Uh, this was kind of five years ago, when five, six years ago, when we started. Now all these data are kind, kind of very frequently used data uh, for this type of studies. But anyway, we took um, data who try to represent um, instability of the country. So even data from the GDELT repository, which is about uh, daily events by country of origin of different things, including conflicts, uh, social unrest, economic status, and things like that. Then we experimented with Google Trends data, uh, trying to understand whether there is some kind of signal in this data. We took also official statistics like the, the Frontex data, so these are monthly detection of illegal border crossing on different routes by, and these are data by citizenship. And then the ASO operational data. So these, these were not the official statistics, but the, the operational data, uh, which were using internally, uh, like to pre-allocate resources uh, for the agency. And then all of this went to a normalization process, some, what I call the clock alignment and filtering, and once the data are normalized, the analysis starts. So I want to go through all these steps just to um, yeah, to share with you this experience. Then the system was composed of two parts, the early warning and the forecasting. But as I said, the, the forecasting part, although it was quite accurate, and it is still quite accurate in, uh, in the type of the results that it gives, uh, is not the main focus of my presentation today. So. So the early warning system was just to analyze these hundreds of time series because we're talking about like 400 time series entering the system. And we need a way to summarize uh, whether there is some important signal in this data or not to be used later for the forecasting model. So we kind of statistically select the variables rather than just let the machine learning model to do this. So some change point analysis, some lead lag analysis, some momentum approach to see whether you will see that the time series uh, get um, an unpredicted uh, acceleration or deceleration for some reason. And then it went through the, to the model. What we call the dyn dynamic elastic net is the model that we use, which is an elastic net based on, uh, on time series data. And then the forecasting part. So I'm going to this, this, uh, describe all this system. So first of all, uh, the GDEL. So GDEL comes as a series of events correlated to different type of, um, I mean, there is, there is a code book which describes each type of events and which topic it, it, it refers to. We selected uh, five categories uh, or six, six, no, five for this study. So conflict, economic events, social unrest events, governance related events and political events. And then we need to assign a sign, like this is a, a push factor or not, this type of event for our type of analysis and also the strength because the literature says that, um, and Marcello is the expert here, that for some reason, this kind of event as a strength and for these conflict, I have an indicator that we're going to build, which is three times the, I don't know, the decrease of CIS5 for some reason. So I didn't discuss this. I just take it for granted. 
<coughs> and, and so this is how we we built the indicator. After that, we built um, five indicators, the J that you see in front of this of each variable. And um, this is just a cumulative sum of the events multiplied by the sign on the sign. So the idea is that uh, there might be countries which are in uh, constant, say, small conflicts going around, but at some point this this explodes. So the 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 fact that we take we took cumulative data is kind of to uh, try to see when this accumulation of tension actually generates something like a migration flow, and that's why we we consider this. So IASO then uh, built on top of some combination of this, um, a composite indicator, which is called the push factor indicator, which I think is still in use in the agency to try to, to monitor the situation in different countries. Then we went to, you know, you know how to, to eliminate this bar, which I ate. I hate this bar. I don't know. <laughs> the green? Oh, there it is. Okay. Thank you. I mean, not entire, but. Oh. A little bit. And just click here. I mean, after three years of pandemic, I still don't I mean, fight with this. Anyway, uh, Google uh, search data, which is. Uh, something that you can download from the Google Translator. There are no API, but you can kind of construct API for, for this. It's about searches in the country of origin. And rather than searching for, uh, for keywords, for explicit keywords, we went for, um, although the system is configured where you can put anything in the system, but we decide, uh, so this is a design choice to go by topics. The reason why we went by topic is that, uh, um, these keywords are aggregated by language uh, by Google through some obscure mechanism, but the idea is that they are comparable in terms of what they mean in the different uh, countries. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, they are comparable. Um, you have larger volumes because most of the times if you focus on keywords, you have time series which are zero or very low value, which are actually not helping the analysis. And, uh, of course, depending on the resolution on which you take the data, you can have daily data, weekly data, monthly data, depending on how long you take time series. Anyway, the, of course, the cons with all these type of data, you know, and there will be several uh, uh, talk on this, is that these are semi-black box the way they are constructed. So we never know about, I mean, we know about the trends, and this is why it's called Google Trend, but we don't know about the absolute uh, value of this number of search, and we don't know even the denominator of this search. So what is this ratio that we see? Anyway, so it's important to see the trends. In our, in our um, objects was just to capturing uh, the trends. Then we took official statistics and unofficial statistics, so not, not still official statistics, like the front-end IBC data by root and the ASO applicants by the dyads, uh, origin destinations. Then we put some other things like recognition rate, calendar holidays because applications are not really uh, data like arrivals like IBC or yeah or in general arrivals. The reason why is that they are uh, process data. So application, for example, have a cap uh, because this is the ma maximum number of application an agency can treat by this month or by this week and but it's not related to number of people really coming. So it's kind of different when you when you try to model this. So you need to take also into account calendar holidays. So there is a big drop down in mid-August and also at the end of the year. Not because migrants do not arrive in August, especially in Italy, for example. Actually, it's the highest month of arrivals just because they are on all this. So the agency do not work those days. I mean, do not work to register the data. So you get the data the next month. And the recognition rates, is a way to take into account also the fact that the migration flows uh, also uh, depends on how easy for the migrants is to, to take some route rather than another route. So we try to capture also this phenomenon. And then the normalization or pre-processing part. 
So first time we, we need some kind of interpolation to adjust for time, but also we need to, to adjust for uh, the definition of what is origin and destination because data are of different type as you have seen. So we, we had to match routes, of course, for IBC, a citizenship for recognition rate, different country destination, and then take the EASO data for origin destination. So after this normalization, which of course has some pitfalls, but it's a decision you have to take, then we did further cleanup. So we clean up for missing data and we clean up for, uh, for variables which have very low variance or no variance. So process which are stable do not give you any information about what's up, what's happening next, okay? So we try to, to reduce this number of like 500 variables to some reasonable number that you can work with. And this is changing root by root. So the idea that I'm conveying here is that uh, although it would be nice to have a single uh, migration model based on just on theory of migration, in practice, drivers of migration in a small time scale can change a lot from, from the theoretical uh, the willingness of the researcher to have one single model for everything. So in terms of uh, how we detect uh, things, of course, we, we, we apply two standard techniques. One is the change point analysis for the mean of the process. So for example, uh, these are historical data. So this is where the, the, the statistics learn. And this is the, the latest period of observations. Within this, let's say your right-hand side uh, number of data, we change for a change point in the trend. And so for example, uh, this, in this example, we see that there is an increase of uh, trends. And then we measure also the acceleration. So what we call momentum, this is a, um, a knowledge inherited from finance. So if you want to see whether you want to invest or disinvest the money in some stock, you look at the momentum, uh, which is the ratio between the um, um, rolling means, so short-term means and uh, long-term means. And if these two numbers are the same, it means that the, the time series is more or less behaving like, like the past. If it is increasing because the, the short-term mean is actually going up or down, uh, then you see there is a momentum. And the moment is where you want to put money on or remove money, depending on which side you are. Then we did the same for, uh, for the variance. So we took the rolling variance. And because also the change in variance uh, is, a, is an indication of instability of the time series, which might matter the analysis. So not just the trend, but also the variance. And so we did some kind of, and so you can see here is an example of how we can spot change points in the change of the variance. Uh, and according to the fact that the, this variance goes to zero or actually increase, we decided to keep or not this time series in the, in the analysis later. And then there are other things because we don't know what the absolute value means for, for example, for um, for the G delt or even for the conflict data. Um, we need to take into account whether, with respect to, I mean, how the last months for this data behave compared to the 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 mean of, of the past data. The explanation for looking at this is again because, for example, as I said, there might be countries which are unstable, but they have some kind of instability, which is kind of constant. It seems like um, a joke, but the idea is that um, there, as I said, there, are, there might be several conflict going on, small conflict, which, which is kind of the normality for a country. So, and this number may be high compared to another country where there is a very little conflict, but when there is a conflict, this generates lots of migration. So. It's important again to also consider the baseline for each country differently. So the absolute value for us did not really meant something. And the same is for Google Map. We want to see whether there is some kind of deregulation in the data. And we did the same also for all the say official statistics. You can see all together. And uh, we try to kind of summarize which are the for this particular week and for this particular uh, origin destination uh, route. 
where are the variables which had more instability with respect to the, the previous periods. And in the end, what we measure, so the, say the dashboard of early warning looks something like this. So you have for each uh, country of origin, destination EU in this case, it is shown. Uh, we saw how many type of signals we have. And so this is an indication of, um, we need to keep an eye, for example, on this route for some reason. And then whether this, this number of signal, for example, in terms of the trend of number of applicants, is positive or negative, and whether each of these signals is a strong signal like NAND3, the red one, or it's a, a, a L1, it's a, it's a small signal. So we have a way to, to discriminate within the intensity of the signals. That's a dashboard which changes weekly, and uh, it can give you information about what's going on. So after this, we went to the, uh, the next step, uh, which is about identifying correlation uh, between variables um, of interest, like the number of applicants in a given country from a given uh, country of origin, uh, with respect to other variables. So there might be, uh, say, asynchronous correlation going on, but just because, um, yeah, because just the processes are not uh, going at the same time. So, for example, if if I'm coming from I don't know, from Iraq, and I want to go to Germany, maybe I'm going to look at what is happening now in Turkey. So can I pass to Turkey or should I take another route? And so maybe if I do the search of something happening in Turkey or or the situation, the political situation in, uh, in Turkey is very important to decide whether in three months I will see people uh, arriving in Germany or I don't know, whatever else. And so we, we apply this methodology, which is called a synchronous covariance estimator. And the idea is that we, if you have two time series lagged by a theta uh, parameter, theta is time, this just uh, look for the maximal cor asynchronous correlation between two time series. And if it is positive, we say that then X leads uh, Y by this amount of time and vice versa. And so what we did, once we discovered these uh, legs, we actually took the original the, the original time series and the lag time series in the same model. And this is the what happens. So this is the correlation matrix. This is really correlation of uh, covariance between all these variables in the model. And this is the correlation after switching, shifting, let's say, uh, each variables by the amount of time that the lead lag analysis is safe. And you can see emerging correlation from this, uh, from this picture. So all of them are taken into account. Those that after shifting present zero correlation are removed from the analysis. Okay, and then the model. The model is a, is a typical um, elastic net model, which means it's a, an autoregressive model. In our case, otherwise it's just a, um, a, an OLS model. So this is an autoregress in the sense that we, we in the explanatory variables, we also put the application in the previous period, plus all the predictors in the previous period. And then we penalize uh, this by two uh, penalty functions. Okay, better than nothing. So two penalty functions. Uh, these penalty functions so this is the typical OLS part, and this is the two penalty uh, function for the L1 and the L2. So you take the squares, the sum of the squares, or the sum of the absolute value of the coefficient that you want to minimize during the, uh, this, is the, this fitting part. So there are several tuning parameters in this analysis. One is alpha, and the other one is lambda. So alpha is kind of independent of time in the sense that you decide which type of penalty do you want to use in the model. Lambda depends on the window of time we are working on. So in this case, this is an only window. Here in the example, uh, I took 30 periods, but I think in our analysis, this, this is the number that you can configure depending on the speed of your time series and also the granular resolution of the time series. But anyway, we took the last uh, 30 periods to fit the model and we want to predict the next. 
So this model uh, is such that if you take alpha equal one, you actually uh, remove the L2 penalty, and this is the last estimate, which is uh, an OLS with the, where you also do uh, model selection, meaning that some of the coefficients are sent to zero artificially by this optimization process. If you take alpha equal zero, you drop the L1 penalty, L2, L2 penalty, and this is the ridge regression. A ridge regression is, I mean, it was introduced to take into account autocorrelation between variables, which exists when you, when you have hundreds of variables, you might have spurious correlation, and then the model can just crash down during the fitting because of this multiple correlation. So, uh, and if you take alpha equal to zero five, you are in between. So you kind of take into account the model selection, so you want some of the coefficients going to zero, so you want to reduce the dimensionality of the model because you want to learn from the model. And you take into account that there might be correlations, so kind of variable we substitute one, each, one another uh, that you want to treat automatically in the model. So that's the idea. Uh, and lambda is this coefficient, which actually is put in front of, of the regression coefficients, which is I mean, if it is zero, it means that you, you are not applying any penalty. So this is simple OLS. If you put something positive there, it can be negative. It means that you are adding weights to the, the speed at which this coefficient goes to zero. So you try to, to force the model selection more and more. And this cannot be chosen example. It requires some kind of um, cross-validation. And this is what we did. So we, we take a window of data, we run this model several times, and then we optimize with respect to MSE, mean square error, and we select the lambda, which is more or less robust with respect to all these periods. So there, are, there is a lot of, yeah. Okay. okay, it performs quite well uh, in terms of forecasting and um, I have a table at the end, which I'm skipping, which is about uh, how good you can do with this with type of model. So the, this is a short-term forecasting model, meaning that the interest of, uh, of the agency at the time was to predict what will happen in the next month. So four weeks ahead. And that's why we, we have this model based on weekly data. And then we have prediction at one, two, three, four steps ahead, just to have uh, the coverage. So it's very good. Uh, I'm skipping this. But the, the nice thing of this model, I think it's this part here. So this is a, a so here you have the number of selection for this particular route, which is Syrian versus uh, going to Greece. And this, these are the weekly outcome of the models. So what you see here are the number of which variables have been taken into account by the model, which variable have been selected, and also their relative weight. So if you see a red dot here, it means that this is very, I mean, highly important as a predictor for this particular week. If it is white, it means that this variable will be discarded by the model. Otherwise, you have some kind of relative importance, like medium importance. So what you see here, if you observe this uh, through time, you can see that there are patterns. So during this period of time, for example, these predictors are very important to predict this particular flow. And then <laughs> during, this is December 27 to July 2018, you can see that those variables there are very important also to predict. And then in the second part of, of the, the last part of the analysis, other variables becomes more relevant than, uh, than before. Like for example, all of these variables start becoming just important predictor for the model. That's why, uh, we suggest that a single model is not really, um, I mean, single model means where you choose the variable and you want those coefficients not to be zero. Uh, this is uh, why, we, why we think this is not really important. But this is hard to understand. So which variable is more important for this particular uh, route? Um, so we construct this plot, which is the importance frequency space, where essentially we, we kind of uh, project all this uh, heat map on this graph in this way. So here you have the relative importance from zero to one. One is the most important, zero is a uh, good start variable. And this is the number of times this variable has been selected. So never and always. So you can get that, for, for example, for, for root 
root two is the red root, and the red root one is the another root. So predictor A can be highly important uh, for root one, and it is also selected many times. While the same predictor can be very low important, although it is also selected many times. And the rest of the graph you can you can guess. So what gives us this uh, this this graph? It gives a way to understand whether uh, this variable is, for example, often selected but not so important. While, for example, the other one. So this is uh, the the path from Syria to Greece. And you see the most important variable, which is uh, very often selected, is the situation of the economy in Turkey, meaning that you can capture the uh, the impact of the of the counter of transit or to, yeah or the counter of crossing for this particular route. So it's it's a way to understand uh, how it works. And then you can use this also. Sorry, it's always on top of. The relevant part. So these are the the same plot. Anyway, so the same plot for different zones. So you can compare for different routes uh, from the same country of origin to different country of destination, which are the variable which have been selected most of the time by the model. So they have an impact in in to predict these particular flows because time is almost finished. So you can do this by country destination, you can do this by country of, sorry, country of origin or country of destination. And for example, you can see that for people coming from Iraq, which is this color, um, to France, there are some variables on the uh, top right corner, which are very important. So the situation in Jordania, situation in Greece, in the, the governance, say, index of Turkey, while, for example, I don't know, going to from Syria to France, other variables are more important than those. Although it's the same people traveling to different uh, countries. And then also at aggregate level at EU, you can also analyze these, uh, these flows and see that from different countries to EU, there are different, um, say, push factor. Uh, which are relevant, which are kind of exp um, extracted by this methodology, and that you can later fit in a in a good model for this particular. I think time is over, so but thank you very much. Uh, Perfect. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, interesting workshop. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about uh, today is uh, um, measuring people displacement using Facebook data. Actually, we will see two different types of uh, Facebook data, uh, which uh, I know that will be also covered by um, another speaker um, by looking at the agenda, which are the Facebook advertising uh, platform data and Facebook uh, social connectedness uh, index data. Uh, let me first uh, start with this uh, uh, pretty busy um, figure. Um, last year at the GRC, together with Stefano, uh, we published a um, uh, science for policy report uh, where we mm, reviewed um, more than 300 scientific, scientific articles or reports uh, employing uh, innovative data to study migration, demography, and um, human mobility. So the aim was to have an overview of all, uh, let's say, the possibility out there in the literature. Uh, and we try to um, categorize them by their common promises and pitfalls. Uh, I'm not going through all the uh, these data sources, which is not the scope of my presentation, but just focusing on the social media data. Um, let's say that uh, uh, they are for sure an interesting data source for researchers because uh, um, they might provide useful insights uh, where uh, uh, there is a lack of uh, data in the migration landscape. Um, for instance, they are um, widely um, available. They cover uh, more or less all the globe. They can reach... Uh, uh, different types of populations, uh, which are normally quite uh, difficult to reach uh, with uh, um, traditional methods. 
and they also can provide uh, timely information about uh, different types of population. Of course, there are uh, limitations using this data. For instance, uh, there is a selection of uh, uh, there is a selection and geographical bias because they don't cover uh, different populations and different areas the same way. Uh, this is basically because of the penetration rate of a specific technology, such as Facebook, for instance, uh, which might be used a lot uh, in Europe, but not as much in uh, Africa, I don't know. Um, then there is, of course, the privacy and ethical concerns. Uh, so before using most of the innovative data, I would say, but also the social media data, uh, we must take into account uh, uh, privacy concerns. Uh, uh, they should be anonymized, uh, not to incur into uh, problems when trying to publish something with this data. So let's dive straight into uh, the first of the two uh, Facebook uh, data that I'm going to talk about, the Facebook advertising platform. So it is not a data type, it's a platform that uh, um, through an API, which is public, uh, it does only uh, need um, a Facebook account allows a user to estimate a target audience for a, um, an advertising campaign. So it is not meant for uh, migration research, but still researchers in the past, and also Ingmar knows it very well, uh, have used it to study, for instance, migration stocks, uh, um, estimate population, and so on. The good thing about this uh, platform is that it allows uh, the user to um, let's say, define the target audience uh, by different characteristics of uh, the Facebook users, actually, which might be, for instance, their age, uh, their gender, the education, uh, their interests, and so on. And of course, uh, the, it is available not only um, through different areas of the world, but also over time. So we can create, actually, a, a spatial temporal uh, series with this type of data. There are, of course, of course um, cons uh, in this data. So we are not seeing actually uh, real populations here, but we are seeing uh, Facebook accounts, or at least, uh, let's say, estimates of Facebook activity provided by this platform, meaning that what you get is the target audience in terms of uh, monthly active users estimates. Okay, How many users have been active on the Facebook uh, uh, applications and services? based on the uh, characteristics of the users that we want to know. Uh, therefore, they are not designed to match population census estimates or their sources. So we need to take this into account and each time contextualize the use of this data uh, for the scope uh, that we want to, to deal with. There are also uh, Facebook user reported demographics that might be not true for whatever reasons, or for instance, they also cannot might not be updated and last but not least definitely um the facebook does not disclose the nationality of their users so we need to find a way to know uh the nationality some someone some somehow else and the first case study i want to present is about uh, uh, the use of this data to study their potential for um, understanding the flows of people uh, from ukraine uh, after the war uh, has started through, uh, sorry, towards the European Union member states. So we are talking about um, a country scale uh, analysis. We started the collection of data uh, just uh, a bit before uh, the start of the war uh, in Ukraine. And we do it uh, on a weekly basis till uh, we are doing it, we are collecting this data meaning that each week uh, we collect uh, uh, monthly active users estimates from the platform. What are the two main user characteristics that we use for this uh, uh, analysis? Uh, there are basically these two, uh, the location of the users, so where the user is, and uh, the language of the users. Why the language? Because uh, this was the best proxy of the nationality we could find for uh, Ukrainians and uh, nationals, okay? So we are targeting Ukrainian nationals in this analysis, but I'm going to talk a bit more about this uh, uh, limitation and pros uh, of the language uh, filter in a while. So the limitation of the location is that we really don't know how Facebook uh, um, find the users, let's say. Uh, so we, uh, we basically um, 
believe that uh, the, the, the estimates that we get are guaranteed to be uh, correct, but we actually don't know the methodology behind. So it's kind of a, a semi-black box as uh, some data that were presented before. In the case of um, the location, we can also filter for different uh, location statuses, as you can see. So we can target people that uh, live in a specific location or just passing by for uh, traveling reasons uh, or just because they are uh, passing through a specific location. And this is important if you want to target people that are stable in a location or are just moving. And of course, the, the other important filter that we are using has several um, assumptions, caveats, and limitations, let's say. So the first one is that Ukrainian is the, the most spoken language in, uh, uh, in Ukraine, but it's not the only one. The second being uh, Russian. The problem of uh, uh, Russian language for uh, um, targeting, let's say, Russian nationals, as you can, as you might imagine, is that uh, many people uh, outside of Ukraine also speak uh, um, speaks uh, Russian. In the case of Ukrainian uh, language, is not very diffuse outside of Ukraine, and in particular, is not very diffuse in uh, um, in the European Union. So, it might work better as a proxy of uh, Ukrainian nationality. Um, of course, not people fleeing uh, Ukraine are uh, Ukrainian nationals. There are also third party nationals uh, uh, fleeing the war. Uh, but according to a recent questionnaire by uh, UNHCR, uh, most of the refugees respondent were 99% per were uh, Ukrainian nationals. So we are probably omitting a small part of the people. Um, and then uh, the, the major problem when using this uh, language filter is that uh, we cannot target people under the age of 18. So this means this is a limitation of the platform. If you want to use the language as filter uh, for the target audience, uh, Facebook does not give you um, the estimates for people under the age of uh, 18 years old. So having said all these uh, uh, aspects, what can we do to understand if these data are a good proxy for uh, nationality? Well, first of all, we need to adjust a bit these, uh, these estimates. We cannot use them uh, as is. So the first thing we did was to, um, let's say, come up with a Facebook penetration rate, meaning that we divided the estimates uh, before the war started. So assuming that the situation was rather stable uh, by the population under 18 years old uh, with the Ukrainian citizens across the different member states. And we use this factor uh, to adjust uh, each of the uh, monthly active users estimates that we get from uh, the uh, advertising platform. And at the end of the day, uh, what we did was a simple uh, correlation test to see if uh, uh, the two data sets, uh, uh, let's say, were somehow comparable. And it seems to be the case. Uh, here we are using uh, data from Eurostat uh, about uh, um, the number of people uh, with the Ukrainian citizens uh, uh, in the various uh, member states under the age of 18 years old, because this was also possible to do with their start data. After all this uh, um, processing, we were able to get a sort of signal from this data about uh, uh, the uh, displacement trajectories of these people fleeing uh, the war. And uh, on the left side, you can see, for instance, uh, at the latest week uh, we had, at the time of writing the article, uh, most people were supposedly moving uh, towards Poland, followed by uh, Germany, and the rest is just a list of uh, the other member states which uh, had an increase in these monthly active users compared to the baseline, which was the pre-war uh, situation, uh, above a 2% level. On the right side, you can see that there is also, let's say, the, the, the whole time series for the five weeks that we are considering in this, uh, in this, um, um, in this work. And you can also see for Hungary, uh, Romania, Poland, and Slovakia, which are the uh, four member states bordering uh, Ukraine, that we also have a comparison, uh, which uh, is in the form of uh, UNHCR data portal data, uh, arrivals uh, to, this, uh, to these countries. For, uh, I would say that except for Romania, the trend looks uh, kind of similar. Um, you, you see a bend, and it's because uh, uh, the, the thing that I'm plotting is uh, the original monthly active estimates and the uh, adjusted values uh, with the method that I showed you before. 
this is another case studies a case study where we applied uh, the same uh, uh, data uh, to study let's say the the consequences on this uh, uh, facebook activity um because of the earthquake uh, uh, of turkey and syria uh, in this uh, this this february and we are comparing now uh, the monthly active users estimates from the facebook platform uh, before and after the earthquake and as you can see there was a huge increase we are now looking at turkey and as you can see we can go even further uh, in detail uh, compared to the national uh, analysis that we did before so we are now looking at uh, turkish provinces and you can see there is a clear there seems to be a clear pattern uh, in these uh, um, these uh, um, relative changes the more the dark let's say the, the red areas are where these uh, changes are incrementing and this happens uh, apparently uh, in the area hit by the earthquake and around the earthquake which are uh, where the star symbols are and all the other areas uh, so uh, um, a decrease in this uh, um, monthly active uh, uh, usage what we can say about this um, one might argue that uh, people uh, is moving uh, towards the area hit by the earthquake to provide support, but this, this is really just uh, a spe speculation. We cannot prove this, unfortunately. Um, what is interesting is that uh, we can uh, see from the data one year before, if this happened because of seasonality, for instance, uh, just to say, uh, okay, this is not a signal of a shock changing the system, but uh, it happens uh, uh, all the time. This does not seem the case, as you can see from the feature, uh, comparing the same period, but one year before. Uh, in this case, uh, not only we don't see the same uh, clustering of activity, but uh, also we can see that the relative change, the magnitude, is much lower compared to what happened after the, the earthquake, after the shock. There is more, much more activity um, after the, the, the earthquake than uh, when there was none. So the second and last uh, uh, Facebook data that I want to talk about briefly is the social connectedness index. So this time, uh, this index is generated by um, not a, an advertising platform, but by people working at the Data for Food team at Meta, uh, who are also engaging researchers and university uh, for producing this type of data. Uh, this is not the only data that they have. They also provide different uh, data set that uh, it can also be used for uh, studying migration, but I'm focusing on this one right now. What it is, it's uh, an index that uses a snapshot of uh, Facebook users and their friendship networks to measure the intensity of uh, connection, digital connection between two locations at a specific time. Um, so actually, we know how this is calculated because, uh, uh, let's say, the methodology is more transparent in Data for Good than it is uh, for the Facebook uh, advertising platform. You can see the equation by which uh, the social connectedness index between location I and J is calculated. Uh, and I can tell you also that uh, um, these, uh, these numbers are even um, further processed by adding some noise to anonymize the data. Uh, they don't take into account, for instance, uh, uh, Facebook users when, uh, where, when they are, are too, uh, too few people because of um, privacy uh, concerns. And we try to use this type of data uh, to um, always in the context of the war in Ukraine. Um, on the left, you can see the social connection between uh, the various uh, regions in uh, the European Union uh, and Ukraine as a whole, as a country. And the darker, uh, the more connected these areas are with, uh, with Ukraine. I'm speaking of uh, connection. When I'm, when I'm talking about connection, I'm, I'm talking about uh, uh, friendship networks, uh, meaning the digital friendships of Facebook. And we try to use this data to um, estimate the um, diaspora at a regional scale. Um, actually, it was not the only uh, variable uh, entering the system, but uh, o o um, there, there are also a few other readily available variables, just like the total population in the destination country and the location of, uh, of the various areas. But as you can see, um, for these specific uh, five uh, member states, um, this social index uh, seems to work uh, pretty well in estimating the, uh, the diaspora. Why we are doing this? 
for this main reason, uh, because diaspora is one of the major drivers of migration. And because uh, uh, at this uh, uh, spatial level, it's not that common to uh, to have this type of data, uh, at least updated all the time or uh, released in a timely fashion, I would say. So this should uh, fill a gap in the uh, migration data landscape that we don't have. Um, so our future research, uh, of course, will further investigate on the use of this uh, uh, indicator to to study to predict also the migratory flows. So we we can we can use diaspora, of course, because the literature uh, is telling us that is the major driver. But we we can also try to use this, this same indicator as a part of uh, our um, modeling. And not only for Ukraine, uh, we want to know if uh, this is also valuable for uh, other countries as well. Uh, this is just another example of a study that uh, uh, employed this uh, social indicator um, to study migration. Uh, it's a work made by uh, Rao et al. And they identified potential settlement areas in those countries based on um, the social connectedness uh, measured by Facebook and uh, the high level, uh, sorry, the, the increase of uh, population in the various areas. So in, in red, you find what the authors think are the potential settlement areas for um, Ukrainian refugees. And this will help anticipate, for instance, the migratory flows or help uh, managing the migratory flows. The very last slide, what are the main takeaways of this presentation uh, on Facebook data? The good thing about this data is that they are, uh, provide timely information and they are very diffuse, although they don't cover different areas and population at the same time. So we always need to be aware of this limitation. We need to validate them if possible with official statistics. It's not always possible, as we were saying before, uh, using innovative data. Uh, so, um, but at least if you know they uh, work somewhere, uh, we might think we can apply them to other cases as well. Um, but still, uh, we have to take in, into consideration the context. In the case of Turkey, uh, for instance, uh, the government shut down the social media, uh, Facebook, for instance, uh, usage for a few days. Um, it was not the case of the figure I showed you before, but the following weeks, uh, the, the signal was not that present as we hoped, uh, for this reason, probably. The methodology is not always transparent, although uh, as we as we saw for the data uh, made by Data for Good team, uh, it's a bit more transparent than it is for the uh, Facebook advertising platform. And I would say that in the end, uh, this type of data are best when combined with official and traditional data. Just like uh, uh, we saw with Google Trends, uh, uh, is very useful when combined with uh, uh, other type of data, even if they are not uh, official but operational, but still. Mm -hmm they are recognized as uh, uh, meaningful data in the field of uh, uh, migration. Thank you. I was setting up, I, as far as I know, um, Facebook also let go of quite a few people in the data for good team just a couple of days ago, right? Like sort of, so, so there are also those things are always moving. And some of the data sets that used to be open are no longer open sort of, so, so there's also some, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, nice to see how things are developing there, unfortunately. There. Great. Right. Yeah. Good. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Excellent. Right. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. Um, okay. Um, 15 minutes, 38 slides. Let's go. Okay. So let's see. Okay. So what I just uh, joined work with a number of people. So uh, including at my previous institute, so the Kata Computing Research Institute, uh, in particular, uh, Marie Rufner, who's done uh, some analysis you'll see later. And then at my new institute, I'm uh, building up a team there. And so this is still sort of, you know, these, they will sort of contribute, but they haven't contributed uh, uh, much yet. Um, basic question is what kind of population changes can we see from space, right? So at the very high level, of course, many of, I mean, all of you have seen sort of these sort of time-lapse videos, right, from Google Earth, where you sort of see whole cities um, uh, expanding or sort of, or sort of, right? And of course, the, the, I mean, but, but this is on time scales, we might not interested in, in this particular workshop, right? Obviously, there's still a signal there, right? Um, other sort of things that might be of relevant that we are not working on in our team, right? Sort of, sort of like refugee camps and how they are sort of growing, or sort of, sort of again, they sort of work um, on that using satellite imagery in particular, right? Sort of, so automatically detecting and counting cans and, uh, tents and sort of relating that to um, uh, refugee um, flows. Um, somewhat related, there's work on uh, detecting um, damaged buildings, right? You would imagine that if a building is damaged in an earthquake, right, then people no longer live there, they have to go somewhere 
uh, else again. And so it's also somewhat relevant, but it's not work that we are doing um, uh, in our team. But again, there is a lot of work uh, out there that uh, does uh, this type of work. So what we are interested in is whether we can detect um, um, refugee movement in satellite uh, images. And we started this uh, thinking about this a couple of years ago, uh, mostly in the sort of Syrian uh, context. Right? We were wondering sort of, can we see something, you know, sort of a sort of a so um, related to this phenomena um, uh, from space? Um, there could be two basic approaches on how to do this. So on the left is you try to sort of capture flows, right? Like in the moment, right? You, if, if there was like enough satellite images, right? You would sort of, you know, hope that you can capture like cues on roads, right? And you sort of count, oh, there are a lot of cars going in this direction or sort of a side, like sort of a side. And the other approach sort of is more like about sort of stocks where you sort of before and after images and you sort of see that cars have um, uh, uh, disappeared, right? Um, so far, we are mostly focusing on the um, second one, although but back to the first one, mostly related to sort of data, data availability, right? So to be able to do this, what you need very, very highly updated sort of uh, imagery. And so initially, so we went with the second um, um, uh, uh, approach, right? Um, in terms of actually sort of detecting cars, sort of a sort of a so there's existing work out there, so you don't have to reinvent sort of object detection and computer vision. What we are using for at the moment, just sort of for this sort of preliminary analysis uh, work that was done uh, in this paper um, uh, related to uh, sort of analyzing uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, you know, related sort of things. And people were kind enough to put their sort of, uh, you know, model and everything sort of a sort of us on GitHub. So this was, of course, very um, helpful. Um, in their work, they were interested in uh, COVID-related uh, sort of changes to mobility, right? We can sort of see this is a parking lot of a car rental uh, location, and then sort of, you know, after COVID, right, none of the cars were rented out, right? And similarly above, you see sort of um, airports where a lot of planes are sort of um, uh, grounded. Um, on the right, you see the um, performance of their sort of object detection for a number of different sort of classes, so red, small objects, blue, medium objects. Um, uh, uh, darkish blue, black is sort of large objects. And for this work, we are using this sort of small car class, which has like an okay performance. So it's around sort of 0 0.5 um, mean average precision and math. But um, so, I mean, you, you'll see some other variation uh, later. So it sort of kind of works okay-ish, let's say, sort of or so, no, not perfect. So with that detector already existing, so the question is, okay, how do we get data? So in my previous institute, we actually paid for uh, accessing uh, Maxa's uh, platform. So Maxa or, you know, sort of owns Digital Globe is sort of the main provider of digital or high resolution satellite uh, images. So on most sort of, you know, Google Earth or Google Maps images, if you zoom in, you know, at the bottom, it will say sort of copyright from um, uh, 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 Maxa or Digital uh, a globe. So with that access to this platform, we selected a couple of locations. So we started in, um, for example, in Syria, looking at Alba, and then you can sort of see the temporal uh, availability, right? Which sort of varies, right? Like quite um, um, uh, a bit, right? Sometimes we have like sort of several pictures, um, you know, within a month, and then there's sort of like other periods where you go several months um, without any uh, pictures. So it's not a fixed update um, uh, frequency, right? Basically depends on sort of market demand, right? Like if there's something actively going on, right? Sort of, sort of, so then they might sort of point the satellite and sort of take a, um, a snapshot. If there's nothing going on, you know, there can be sort of months um, without updates. And then, you know, we did some additional filtering um, cloud coverage, which in the case of Syria, is not much of a problem, but you know, Ukraine is a very different sort of uh, a beast. So we said not more than 10%. Um, we um, filtered on maximum ground sampling distance, GSE, so resolution 50 centimeter per pixel or, um, uh, uh, or um, higher. And so then, you know, we got the imagery, we ran this existing uh, model, right, sort of detected a bunch of sort of cars, in this case for um, uh, Al-Bab. Um, how well does it work? So here on the left, um, we have um, manual uh, annotation, on the right, you have sort of the uh, computer output, right? Sort of, so it looks okay, sort of, so, right? I mean, and, and sometimes even the manual annotation, it might not, I mean, it's sort of hard to say, right? To see there in this part, there's sort of something where the manual annotator thinks it's probably not a car, right? There's sort of something detected there where you can sort of see a clear um, difference uh, uh, between the two. Um, overall, though, again, it works sort of fairly well, or at least in this sort of best case scenario, right? Like it's completely cloud free. This is 30 centimeter. Imagery is the best uh, possible available uh, imagery, sort of, so you get like an accuracy of sort of close to 80%, which at least for this particular type of model is probably an upper bound. Of course, you know, the models are continuously um, improving, but I, I mean, there's still, there's sort of like an upper bound at some point, you know, you start hallucinating sort of things, right? Because it's really not clear if it's, is this like a picture, uh, is this a car um, uh, or not? 
Um, so then, you know, with this sort of car count, so what do you actually observe? Do you get something that makes sense? Here's just like a, just a preliminary uh, validation in the Syrian context. So on the left, you have uh, car counts for the city of Al-Bab, where there was actually active uh, uh, fighting. And so the fighting happened during this period, marked in, in green, I don't ask why, but anyway. Um, so the first soil, and, and you can see as the fighting approaches, the number of cars detected goes down uh, uh, quite a bit, sort of. So even the, you know before there is definitely fluctuation, but not quite at this sort of level. So this is also in terms of sort of scale, time scales quite rapidly, right? So this is October nineteenth to sort of December eighth, right? In that period, sort of like ninety percent of the cars essentially uh, disappear. And after the fighting, they seem to sort of um, return. So for, for reference, this is another location in Syria where there was uh, no fighting. There's also some fluctuation, sort of, so, and we sort of see later different factors that might um, uh, contribute to, to sort of this sort of uh, normal fluctuation. Um, of course, this is sort of Syria. Now, uh, what's more interesting is sort of Ukraine. Um, so you, here you have sort of two pictures of uh, Kherson before and after the uh, invasion, where you can sort of just visually sort of see there are certainly fewer cars being uh, uh, detected, right? But then these pictures are also different in you know, many ways sort of, also, right? Like sort of, so there's the lighting is somehow different, right? Shadow length, the Nadia angle, whether the satellite is right overhead or not, is different. There might be different times of day or week, right? Maybe people are just you now at home or in the office or parking underground sort of, so, right? so just from sort of two pictures alone, it's sort of hard uh, to say, but just, you know, again, at least it gives something plausible. And in this case, in Kherson, the number of cars um, um, uh, uh, sort of going down. So let's drill a bit. Uh, deeper sort of a sort of a sort of a sort of in terms of what the issues um, are. So, for example, one of the things that always comes up in these models is sort of some sort of precision recall trade off that you can kind of basically um, uh, tune. So, what you can hear on, on the left, this is uh, somewhere in uh, Ukraine, I've forgotten where uh, exactly, where for the same, I mean, the, the model comes with sort of different different confidence thresholds. Like for everything detected, the model tells you like some something like resembling like a probability, right? Like it's, it's like 10% confident or 20% or 50 or 90% confident that it's a car. And now we sort of see different sort of thresholding applied, right? Sort of so, so in, um, uh, uh, in uh, red basically is a sort of like a sort of superset sort of sort of red and yellow basically together means, means red. So anything at least 15% confident would be considered a car, and then in yellow, uh, at least sort of forty-five percent confident is a car, right? And you can so see here that the red, for example, picks up quite a few things that clearly are not things, uh, are not cars. Right? So this is actually on the roof of the building. This is sort of like air conditioning units or something like sort of ventilation um, uh, units or sort of things. Okay. So and this actually we just uh, also saw in other parts of cities in general, where sort of things on roofs look like they could plausibly be cars, right? If you sort of see this in isolation, right? It's like a like a road around, right? So this could be a car, right? But it's um, uh, it's not, right? So now, how do you sort of, you know, but but then maybe this is actually a car, right? So now, if you go for the yellow threshold, right, you would miss this, right? So how do you sort of tune your precision um, um, uh, uh, recall? I don't. So in uh, in particular, what's more important? So for our work, we we, we decided that precision is more important. That what we want to detect is really should be cars. We are fine with leaving out some cars. As long as the things that we detect are cars, because we only want to detect things that are mobile that could go somewhere else, right? So we, it's not just about sort of mapping all the cars in the city, but we only want to detect something, some sort of markers that could people could sort of could take with them and take uh, somewhere else, right? And so we use this sort of if if you're familiar with sort of data science, sort of F zero point five score. It's a variant of sort of F score that gives more weight to um, uh, precision, and then. We looked at sort of what so this we annotated some data still in the Syrian context. We looked at one, you know, if we change the confidence threshold, how does this sort of this objective function um, uh, sort of change? And then there's sort of some optimal sort of point, which in this case is around uh, this sort of 0 0.45 uh, value, right? So, so going forward in all the results, what you see is this cutoff of 0 0.45 uh, for a um uh, for uh, for confidence. Um great. So now we sort of you know, sort of some kind of um, validation for sort of uh, detecting cars with reasonable precision, sort of or so. But of course, we, we're not interested in cars, we're interested in uh, people, right? Sort of, or so. so how do we now link uh, people and uh, cars? So um, this is, uh, I think, averaged across a couple of months, sort of uh, pre-war um, cars in uh, Kiev. I sort of, right? so, 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 so,
um, uh, detected, right? And we also have sort of pre-war um, um, uh, people, right? Sort of, right? And sort of, you see they're somehow related, but it's not, not as straightforward as we sort of uh, thought, right? So you get a sort of kind of relation uh, uh, like this, right? Sort of, so if you sort of compare the individual um, uh, grid cells, right? So for example, here you have quite a few people, but very little cars, right? Maybe these are high-rise buildings and there's you know, no, no, no outdoor parking, something uh, like this, right? So overall you get a relationship um, uh, like this, right? So, so, I don't know, so, so you can fit this in various um, uh, uh, ways. So uh, uh, in my, in my product use the sort of GAM model generalized additive model sort of to, um, uh, uh, to fit this. And now once you have this sort of relationship between cars and um, a population, you can then sort of, you know, go and sort of apply it going forward to, to see, to link the, the um, for this uh, specific city, to see how the population, uh, how the sort of car um, density sort of changes and what would that mean for um, actual people, right? So now these are not estimates of cars, these are estimates of sort of um, uh, people where you have sort of like a pre-war baseline for a Kiev, and then based on the number of cars, you have sort of estimates for the number of um, uh, people. Now, these are averaged across several images in a month, right, sort of or so, and so um, this is already one caveat in terms of temporal resolution. Now, how plausible are they? Um, so this is now a report from uh, early March where supposedly half of, uh, half of the uh, population here had uh, left, right? So here, actually, this would indicate an even uh, bigger drop. It's also not quite, uh, depends on when these pictures were taken in March, right, sort of or so. so Definitely a drop that's plausible, whether half or not, yeah, hard to say sort of or so. Um, but at least just give some sort of plausibility that the directionality is plausible. This is a city um, on, the, um, um, uh, on, on, on the west uh, um, of um, uh, Ukraine, where you see the number of cars uh, going up. So this is on the border with Slovakia. Um, and at least this sort of its upwards trend is again sort of plausible. Here there's the reported estimates that the uh, number of people have now at least tripled. Um, uh, and this was a report uh, published uh, also in now in March. So then it depends on when these pictures were taken that uh, uh, go in this, but at least the directionality is sort of plausible, right? And there's some other sort of hand waving plausibility results. This is now sort of for um, all of Ukraine. I think that this was in. April, I think, April or May, I uh, have to look at the of uh, compare sort of pre-war with post-war uh, uh, sort of changes, right, and to sort of see large point of Ukraine sort of going sort of down, right, like sort of for cars, and therefore most likely also people disappearing, and actually the West see uh, an, um, uh, an increase in the, um, uh, uh, in the um, uh, population. So punchline for this part, oh, okay, audio, okay, I have to hurry up. So, um, so uh, uh, it sort of works, but the main difference, uh, the main difficulty is data sparsity, right? So here you have sort of cities and every row of the month, and you see that all these black areas, there is no, right? So for this city, right, it goes several, several months, like uh, until you have like a picture. And then again, several, several months until you have a picture, right? So for some something like more recent sort of, so it's, it's it's difficult sort of to do something, right? And so we ask ourselves, can we do something using planet imagery um, instead? So planet.com uh, imagery. So planet.com is another satellite imagery provider where the main trend point is this daily, right? So daily uh, Earth observation uh, data, right? Um, so what do these pictures look like? So here on the left, you have a picture from uh, Brussels, right? And you can kind of see there's something on the road, right? These are probably trucks, right? And there's something probably here sort of or so, but you certainly can no longer see individual uh, cars, big trucks maybe, but certainly not individual uh, cars. Right? And similarly here, this is a picture on the um, Ukrainian-Polish border where you can see there's probably something there, probably a queue of cars, but sort of counting cars or detecting individual cars is difficult. Um, data availability is much better though. So here for most days in Brussels, you have a picture where you don't have a picture it's due to 100% cloud coverage, right? So for example, for Death Valley, you have a picture every day, right? There are very, very few uh, clouds um, uh, there, right? And so now if we want to use such images, but without actually seeing individual cars, you know, how do we get training data, right? Like how would we train a model if we cannot actually annotate uh, individual cars, right? So one approach is you use a high res illusion image, right, sort of a so, right? And you annotate the cars and you sort of count, okay, this picture has four cars and then you transform it to like a low resolution image, right? I mean, this, I mean, still higher resolution than actually planet imagery, but something sort of like this. And now you sort of 
So I'm not a detection, but a regression problem. I, you say, okay, here, there, you know, here the answer is four cars, right? I don't, I don't know where they are because they might no longer be individual C, but there's some change in terms of sort of ground reference or something or sort of so. So please just tell me that there are sort of four uh, uh, cars. This might work, but then there are a lot of things how this is not exactly what planet imagery does. Um, for example, you know, this might come from different times of day. Um, this might relate to different shadow lengths, et cetera, et cetera, sort of, so, so punchline in the end, we still want something that is sort of proper sort of ground truth, right? So we want to take something that's temporally aligned. How could we do this? One data source is uh, traffic from Google Maps, right? Where we can sort of see when the image was taken on the planet, this was the sort of traffic pattern in uh, Brussels, right? And we can sort of overlay and basically use this as sort of a kind of like a weak annotation for the computer um, uh, vision model, right? So, so, so. And there are some drawbacks with this, but I think this will sort of work. Another data source is also from Google Maps where you have this live um, in-store traffic, right? Where you can sort of see, okay, at this time when the picture was taken on planet, um, sort of, so this store was so and so busy, right? Like, so, so this would be of use for parking lots. Sort of a soil and sort of so be another sort of weak annotation. And then the last thing we want to do is uh, actually look at um, webcams, right? So for webcams, again, you know exactly when this picture was taken. This is somewhere in Brussels. And you know, okay, when the planet, when the satellite took a picture, there were like three cars there and five cars there. And then you can sort of again validate your um your model. Um okay, so uh sorry for the sprint. Hopefully it was uh somewhat interesting. So to recap. Again, we looked at this, considering these sort of two different types of satellite imagery, the high resolution uh, satellite imagery, right, sort of or so, where uh, detecting individual cars is mostly feasible, sort of or so, um, and you get something that's sort of high level plausible, um, but, um, you know, uh, biggest challenge is the temporal sparsity, right, again, sort of or so, if you have a picture, you can do something, but if you don't have a picture, there's not much you can do. Also, the car detection, if it's especially if you go to the 50 centimeter ground sampling distance, is far from uh, perfect. There are a lot of different sort of things that still get in the um, uh, in the way. Um, if you look at sort of low resolution from planet, uh, sort of so like three meter ground sampling distance, um, that's great. You mostly have daily imagery, except for cloud coverage. Again, cloud coverage is still an issue uh, in, in in Ukraine. Um, also, access is much more affordable, right? This is quite generous, sort of free access for academics. Uh, but now we still have to do figure out the computer vision part, right? Because we can no longer detect, it's no longer about detecting objects, it's about sort of counting without detecting. And this is something we're working on. Uh, and then I'll add with an, a bit of one ad uh, advertisement. So um, uh, later this year, we'll have a kickoff for a new institute that I'm founding, which is the Interdisciplinary Institute for Societal Computing uh, at my uh, uh, university. Um, so if you're interested in this, uh, you know, talk to me in, in a coffee break. We'd love to have some of you um, uh, uh, attend. So in a nutshell, there's sort of two strands that we're working on. There's computing off society, which is all about measuring, you know, sort of a, so things like migration and gender gaps and other things, but then also computing for society, which works, uh, which is about sort of working with uh, stakeholders on these uh, topics. So hopefully improve uh, things ever so slightly. Uh, yeah, thank you very much.